Trinitarians, and welcome to the final installment of this series on lost and forgotten churches. Today we speed ahead massively in time to the 1300s, the 14th century. I'm going to begin in the regions that we've been considering for the last six weeks and end up in Europe and finally in England, which seems appropriate for us as Episcopalians. In 1349, Ibn al-Wardi, an Arab Muslim historian, wrote the following. The plague frightened and killed. Oh, what a visitor. It had been current for 15 years. It began in the land of darkness. China was not preserved from it, nor could the strongest fortress hinder it. The plague afflicted the Indians in India. It weighed down upon the Sindh. It seized with its hand and ensnared even the land of the Uzbeks. How many backs did it break in what is Transoxia? The plague increased and spread further. It attacked the Persians, extended its steps towards the land of Katai and gnawed away at the Crimea. It pelted Rum, which is Byzantium, with live coals and led the outrage to Cyprus and the islands. The plague destroyed mankind in Cairo. Its eye was cast upon Egypt, and behold, the people were wide awake. It stilled all movement in Alexandria. Ibn Elwardi then goes on to describe the plague's movement in Jerusalem, Beirut, Damascus, Aleppo, and Antioch. He describes how the plague destroyed both Shiites and Sunnis alike. He describes how the doctors in Aleppo, really the Islamic center of Syria, he describes how the doctors there attempted to find various remedies, including smearing victims with Armenian clay. The undertakers, if they survived, became wealthy. The streets were full of beers or stretchers with dead bodies. Finally, he interprets the plague as a martyrdom for Muslims a chance to die for a reward and as punishment for disbelievers. When the Muslim endures misfortune, he says, then patience is his worship. If someone causes infection and destruction, if someone says it causes infection and destruction, say God creates and recreates. And we see this theme in a couple other Islamic sources of the cycles of civilizations, both Islamic and not Islamic. Ibn al-Wardi's is one of hundreds, if not thousands, of surviving accounts of what European historians call the Black Death, a plague that struck Europe beginning in 1347 through much of 1348, the first wave ending in 1350. But as this account also shows us, Europe, of course, is not the first continent that experienced the horror that raged throughout Eurasia for decades and even centuries. You heard in the cities of Ibn al-Wardi's account that many, if not all of the regions we've talked about with the churches in the eastern half of the Mediterranean and in the Middle East today were directly impacted by the plague. Most of the Christian minority communities were under Islamic rule by the 14th century. They were severely diminished in numbers. While the Islamic attitude towards the plague included this theological view of martyrdom in suffering, recent scholarship has also shown that just like the medieval European Christians, Muslims also saw the plague as God's punishment and as something to flee from. In the West, at least, the plague came to be um, described rhetorically as king death. And here are a couple magnificent engravings from Hans Holbein, one in which death is literally taking the crown off the head of an emperor, and another where death has taken um, the, the hat of the abbot or the headgear of the abbot and is pulling him along with him. Death is the great leveler, the hugely stratified societies throughout the Eurasian worlds of elites and poor or aristocrats and peasants, everyone is laid low by the plague. Cairo lost a third of their population in the first wave. 
a century later, the city was only just over half of what it had been before. Al Makarizi, an Egyptian historian, claims that in October of 1348, 1,000 people were dying every day in Syria. The famous Islamic traveler Ibn Battuta arrived in Damascus to find that his mother had died in the plague and that each day 2,400 people at, its, at the height of the plague were dying. Then he says, I went to Cairo and was told that the plague, that during the plague, the numbers of death had risen to 21,000 a day. I found that all the sheikhs I had known were dead. May God most high have mercy upon them. What, of course, are we to think in terms of the Christians in these Eastern regions and the plague? Certainly Byzantium is no stranger to plagues. Prior to the Islamic invasions of the seventh century, the city of Constantinople had undergone a massive, undergone a massive plague in the sixth century during the time of Justinian. This plague is famously known as the plague of Justinian. He certainly did not have an easy time of it during his reign. And this is brought by trade along the similar routes of the Silk Road. Hagia Sophia would have been less than a decade old at that point. The historian Procopius wrote his own version of these events in Constantinople in the sixth century. And he mirrors his account on another plague account by the famous Greek historian Thucydides, who writes about the plague in Athens in the fourth century BC when the Athenians are being besieged by the Spartans and they're also impacted um, by a plague from which um, the, the great Greek leader, uh, military leader from the time dies. But in the sixth century, Procopius, the Byzantine historian, describes this. The living were too few to bury the dead and they had to be thrown over the walls and into cisterns. According to contemporary sources, 5,000 people died a day. Outbreaks occurred again of this plague, which some historians say was an early um, form of bubonic plague. Outbreaks occurred again in the seventh and eighth centuries, along with a series of earthquakes. As if that's not enough, in the year 1204, the beginning of the Fourth Crusade, Western Christian warriors get themselves involved in Byzantine politics, and the end result of it is the sack and pillaging of the capital city of Byzantium, which left a deep scar in Eastern and Western Christian relations, so much so that in 2004, Pope John Paul II offered an apology to the Patriarch of Constantinople, and he says this, some memories are especially painful and some events of the distant past have left deep wounds in the minds and hearts of people to this day. I'm thinking of the disastrous sack of the Imperial City of Constantinople, which was so long the bastion of Christianity in the East. It is tragic that the assailants who set out to secure free access for Christians to the Holy Land turned against their own brothers in the faith. The fact that they were Latin Christians fills Catholics with deep regret. How can we fail to see here the mysterium iniquitatis at work in the human heart? I thought that moment in the past is particularly poignant in light of the work of reconciliation that's going on in our own country at currently. And of course, the longtime Christian emperor empire was dwindling under the might of the Ottoman Empire. So all of these things together, looking at Constantinople briefly from the plague of the sixth century on through the sack of the city in 1204, not the only sack it suffered, it was um, bombarded relentlessly. Uh, in its weaker centuries. All of this sort of leads us to conclude that perhaps suffering and tears of the night and destruction of humans by plagues and other humans are historically as common or perhaps even more common than stability and physical peace. Do not be afraid. We are repeatedly told in the scriptures and certainly our human forerunners have had reasons to be afraid. A recent article out of the Epidemiology Department of the University of Athens in 2011 said this, 
During the period of 1347 to 1453, a total of 61 plague outbreaks were noted in the Byzantine Empire. 61 plague outbreaks in the course of six years, which can be distinguished into nine major epidemic waves, 11 local outbreaks, and 16 disease-free periods. The capital Constantinople and the Venetian colonies of the Ionian and Aegean Sea were the areas that are most affected by the 14th century plague. The epidemic waves would last a little over three years. And historians say that scientific ignorance of the nature of the disease, a turbulent period of warfare, and of course, the very organized trading network just contributed to the massive spread of this disease. As far as the other historic centers of Christianity, we have to assume that a diminished church was certainly further diminished by the plague. The experiences of Eastern Christians, including Syrian Christians and the Church of the East, has actually been difficult for me to find over the last week. One article suggested that their treatment as minorities did not worsen due to the plague. In other words, they're not blamed for it. Another reference for which I'm still trying to track down the primary material says, yes, Christians actually were blamed for the plague. So certainly probably a varied experience. All contemporary sources seem to agree that the plague comes out of the East, probably somewhere in Central Asia. Previous generations of historians have said it started basically with an early form of biological warfare in which Mongols, who were currently at that point besieging Chinese cities, threw infected bodies back into these, these cities. Later historians have doubted that this was actually what started it, and they say, it's simply the vast trade routes in the east um, moving into Constantinople and, of course, the Italian port cities um, that are both its initiation and a continuance of the disease. So in summary, what arrives famously in Italy in late 1347 and by the end of 1348 had spread to northern England began about a decade or so earlier in the East on the other side of this vast trading network in a land the Europeans only knew of from the writings of Marco Polo and of course through whispered rumors about strange things in strange places. Maybe a little bit akin to how we think about is there life on other planets today. The forms of bubonic plague that spread beginning in the 14th century were at least two, pneumonic and septicemiac. Of course, that is airborne and bloodborne. There's little benefit for us today, I think, to dwell too long on the physical effects of the plague, but I'm going to give you a very brief description. First, a victim had severe flu-like symptoms, usually accompanied by an extremely high fever. Second, they developed buboes or black welts, usually in the warmer crevices and places of their body. For a minority of people, um, perhaps 10%, those buboes formed internally, not externally. At this stage, a victim suffers from extreme diarrhea and vomiting, and finally, there is respiratory failure or extreme pneumonia the incubation period being between two and eight days. Of course, the lived experience for people is painful. Um, it's rapid. Estimates of mortality in Europe ranged from like 30 to 60% of the population in the first wave. Perhaps as many as 40 million people died in Europe in the first three years. Historians say if you want to have a comparable experience, you need to compare these early years of outbreak to, a, uh, to um, nuclear warfare. The most famous European description of the ways in which people reacted to the plague, of course, come from Boccaccio's Decameron. Now, if anybody's actually gotten all the way through that entire massive book, well done. I have, I have yet to make it through the whole thing. It's one of those penguin editions that's about that large. Boccaccio, as I said, is from Florence, and he vividly describes in his introduction to his fictional narrative um, what his own experience was in, as he observed Florentines reacting 
And he really categorizes these reactions down into four groups. So I'm gonna read out a series of um, interspersed quotes from him. These things, the horrors that he's just described, caused various fears and fantasies to take root in the minds of those who were still well and alive and almost without exception, they took a single and very inhuman precaution, namely to avoid or run away from the sick and their belongings, by which means they all thought that their own health would be preserved. So the constant theme throughout these reactions is to separate yourself from those that are sick. He then says that others were convinced that sober and abstaining habits would prevent them from contracting the disease, in which case they isolated in groups, moving away from the towns and cities without any sick with them, living, quote, a peaceable existence, consuming modest quantities of delicate foods and precious wines and avoiding all excesses. So they also did not want any news from the outside world and they sort of live this life of peaceful ignorance. Another perspective in Florence was that of eating and drinking and merrymaking, and that's the way they thought they could avoid the plague, along with staying away from the sick. These individuals moved from tavern to tavern, and sometimes they would enjoy meals at one another's homes. He says that, quote, such places were easy to find for people behaved as though they thought their days were numbered and treated their belongings and their own persons with equal abandon. A third group didn't remove themselves, nor did they party it up. Rather, they lived moderately and they walk around the streets holding herbal nosegays or floral bouquets in front of them um, simply because of the stench of dead bodies, sickness, and the medicines which seem to fill and pollute the whole of the atmosphere. And one of the classic explanations uh, in the Middle Ages for what caused this was there were a lot of earthquakes and there was this idea that there was this um, gas that was emerging from um, the center of the earth miasma, particularly at night that was polluting the air. A fourth group of people fled their city, their homes, their families and their possessions. These people seem to assume, Boccaccio says, that God's judgment only struck cities and not the countryside. And he's very tongue in cheek, sarcastic when he says that. This image is actually from the 17th century from um, one of the last outbreaks of the plague in London, the last being in 1665. So um, waves came later, although they were um, much less severe. The one in 1665, however, was, um, was, was more severe. Then Boccaccio shares that neighbors and friends not only distanced from one another, but that spouses left one another. Brothers and sisters fled their siblings. Some parents even abandoned their sick children. Because he claimed there were so few people left to assist the dead, the social mores broke down, even to the point that things like male servants being able to care for um, females, Ill, Ill females was something that was allowed um, the papacy later will allow women to offer last rites, and that's seen to be uh, in medieval Europe a sign of how extreme things had gotten. The necessary alterations to things like funerary rituals meant that rather than the typical good medieval death where you're surrounded by many women of your household mourning for you, uh, the priest comes in and gives you. Um, the, the right of extreme unction, the final sacrament of your life in which God's grace is uh, literally bestowed to you. That, of course, no longer happens. Um, he says that um, the bodies of the wealthy are quickly taken away. They're buried in the nearest available grave, not necessarily your own parish churches. The priest says very few prayers, um, very short, if any, liturgy. And you can imagine that the clergy in particular, uh, mortality rates for the clergy are uh, extremely high, higher than almost any other demographic because of uh, their role in Roman Catholic sacraments um, to be present at the deathbed. Priests attended houses expecting to bury one family member and arrived to find the whole family dead. 
The poor, he says, are sometimes piled into streets where bearers would collect them, put them on beers or wagons, and take them and bury them in mass graves outside of cities. The rule of law broke down completely in Florence because so many of the leaders were dead and those that were left had very few people to enforce them. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, by the 1300s, was a monolithic entity, a pan-European authority that could cut across powers of kingship and lordship. Popes were consistently pushing back against the power of temporal rulers and their attempts to control and sway the Italian papacy, though some popes were more willing to side politically with one monarch over another, such as the ongoing debate in this period between France and the Holy Roman Empire. In order to understand the immediate response of the Western Church to the plague, we can look at the various actions an attitude of Pope Clement VI, who, as you can see, is Pope for the 10 years that spans the entirety of that first outbreak. His reputation is a mixed one. Um, he's not really known as a saint, but he's known as a uh, Pope to admire because he's the kind of person you want in charge in a deep moment of crisis because he's sharp, he can get things done, he says strongly what needs to be said, he speaks out um, when things need to be altered. Um, his reputation is uh, somewhat checkered due to nepotism, as well as his preferment for um, France having a closer relationship with the papacy than the Holy Roman Empire. But his work for the Black Death during the Black Death is what really has given him a much more positive reputation. As Europeans looked for explanations of what they called the Great Pestilence, some began claiming unfortunately, that Jews were poisoning wells. Pogroms began appearing across Europe. Jews were tortured. Unsurprisingly, under torture, they confess. Twice in 1348, once in July and once in September, Clement VI issued papal, a papal bull denouncing the massacres, killing of Jews, saying that those that believed the rumors were, quote, seduced by a liar, the devil. He strongly encouraged his clergy to take action and to protect the Jews from uh, these parishioners. Despite this, Jews are attacked, their property is destroyed, and many were burned across the continent. In Avignon, where the Pope resided in France, Jews were protected. Jews in Europe numbered two and a half million in the 14th century. About a third of them live in Spain and in southern France in the region of the Pyrenees. Some of these communities had been in that region, southern region, since the time of the Roman Empire. They were usually well-educated, uh, wealthy. A number of them are bankers. On May 22nd, 1348, King Peter of Aragon, so a Spanish monarch, suppressed violence in Barcelona when 20 Jews were slaughtered and Jewish houses pillaged. Some wealthy Christian town leaders launched a counterattack um, in support of the Jews, which suppressed the riots, and the monarch suppressed inflammatory sermons. The week Earlier in May 1348, there had been anti-Jewish riots in six other Spanish cities. The Jews that survived did so by enclosing themselves in their stone-walled houses and dwellings. As 1348 progressed, Jews were blamed and persecuted in regions of southern France, even before the plague arrives to those regions because the, the rumors and the fears of the plague are so strong. The fear of the oncoming devastation is so strong. In Basel, Switzerland, the town council tried to ban individuals who they knew were especially anti-Jewish. The civilians' outcry is so strong against this that in the end, it's the Jews that are exiled from Basel for 200 years. Some Jews in German cities are protected and helped because of the sympathies of city leaders, while other German cities, such as Augsburg, had city leaders that had a lot of were that were greatly indebted to some of the Jewish bankers. And so they take advantage of the situation and they allow anti-Semitic mobs to do their terrorizing work. 
The entirety of the medieval history of Jews in Europe is marred by discriminatory taxes, special um, discriminatory practices, and of course, moments of massacre. In 1290, the English King Edward I banned the entire population of Jews, which at the time was about 3,000 people. Jews actually don't return to England until the 1650s during uh, the ruling period of Oliver Cromwell. The experience of Jews in Europe between 1347 and 1350 in this first wave of the, wave of the plague, however, is especially horrific. And then some of you also are probably familiar with the fact that in 1492, the Spanish monarchs, the same time that they're sending Christopher Columbus West, um, they ban Jews and Muslims uh, from their kingdom unless they convert. And many of those uh, Jews and Muslims actually move into the Ottoman Empire. And only a few years ago, NPR had a really interesting story about how the Spanish government was actually inviting back any descendants of those um, Jews and was willing to give them citizenship. Many Jews over that next century into the 1400s and even into the 1500s uh, moved to Poland because the ruling monarch there issues an invitation to the Jews and by the early 18th century, half of European Jews live in Poland. So we can draw a, a somewhat of a, a tenuous connection between the experience of Jews in the Black Death and their movement to Poland. And of course, we know um, tragically what happens in the 20th century with Polish Jews. In the vein of the more naturalistic explanation for the plague, Clement VI also asked papal astronomers about potential causes for the pestilence for which they suggested it was a confluence of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, so the largest of the then known planets. It's worth remembering in this instance that the belief of the planets, um, the belief that the movement of the planets could affect the natural order of things, including human experience, was a really old one. And it's one of many um, views such that get taken from uh, Greeks and from Aristotle. And the view was that the universe is unified, harmonious, it's beautiful, it's ordained by God, and it's orderly. All of creation is connected together in this great chain of being with God at the top and rocks at the very bottom. If anything in the social hierarchy or in the planetary structure is out of alignment, it could affect human experience. Boccaccio, in fact, begins his account by saying that some people believed the plague was due to the influence of heavenly bodies. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that the Pope is looking to the stars as a guide to living, right? More akin to what we think of as astrology, but rather his questioning and having his court astronomers there shows this deeply theological view that all the universe is held together by divine will. And there are some medieval natural philosophers that call this kind of attraction, even go so far as to say love is what holds the planets in orbit. If God's grace permeates people's daily lives, if God's power could alter the essence of bread into the body of Christ, then according to the medieval mind, why couldn't God through the planets directly and materially impact humans' lives? So I would just say, while we find um, sometimes these beliefs perhaps a bit odd, I think that there's a consistency and a deep logic to them and a way in which they drew together theology and natural explana explanation that allows us to take these views a little bit more seriously, even though our own perspective um, may have evolved. Of course, the major Christian theological explanation for the plague was as a punishment for sin and the corresponding reaction are various forms of penance, some of them more extreme than others. And I have these two images on the screen just to suggest to you if you're very interested in the Black Death that you should watch or rewatch The Seventh Seal uh, from 1957 by the Swedish director Ingmar Bergman, um, who looks at the life of a knight who is returned from the Crusades, and it's in the midst of um, it's in the midst of the plague. <clears throat> 
One of the most disturbing expressions of penitence for sin, and this is also depicted in the film, The Seventh Seal, was a wandering brotherhood known as the Flagellants, who traveled from village to village and they led village processions. And you can see one of those processions depicted in front of you. The plague of 1348 was another in a long series of natural and political disasters. In Italy, especially, the century before the 1200s had seen a lot of wars between Italian families that had been drawn and torn between the papacy and, and France and the Holy Roman Empire. This, in fact, is the context for Dante's comedy. If you've ever read that and you've wondered why in the Inferno does he have so many uh, Florentines and Italians um, and others in these in these various levels of hell, right? He's reflecting this period angst about the world sort of on fire in Florence in the 1200s. There's also a lot of end times preaching, um, pointing out particular so-called antichrists. There had been an earlier plague in 1259. And so devout Christians, the average Christian in Italy, in Europe, in the century before, even before the Black Death, are looking for new practices, ways um, to make amends spiritually, ways to restore order. So the uh, flagellance sect um, is considered to be eventually heretical, and it had begins, begun centuries before as an expression of extreme ascetic practices. But what would happen is that the order of brotherhood would arrive in a particular village or city, they would um, preach to the townspeople, get them worked up, they would lead them in processions as a sign of penance, they would say prayers and liturgies, particularly around the passion of Christ. Participants are usually stripped to the waist, and you can see that with the brothers there in the image, and they would scourge themselves with leather whips. At the end of each procession, they entered the local church where they prostrated themselves. The processions in the churches usually happened for 33 and a half days, and that was to mirror the length of Christ's life. The first pope bans them in 1290, sorry, in 1260. During the Black Death, they explode the prevalence of this sect and the prevalence of these processions. Um, they spread across Hungary, Switzerland, Flanders, Holland, Bohemia, Poland. They traveled to England. The England seemed quietly um, watchful, but it doesn't take in England. Um, the movement during the Black Death becomes even more extreme in beatings and practices and more pronounced in some of its heretical elements in its theology. And so Clement VI bans it on the 20th of October, 1349. So overall, the reasons for the emergence um, of this particular expression of penance at the start of the plague can be described as follows. There was a desire for the reform of church, frustration with political corruption and a lack of control over the most basic life circumstances drew the European population into these processions. So I think that while this experience seems very foreign to us, I am today struck by this communal sense they have of there's some kind of sin, there's some kind of systemic sin. That point seems worth sitting with given our immediate context of our own confrontation with the systemic sin of racism. The history of the Black Death then is necessarily very dark. The ecclesiastical artwork that develops after the plague focuses increasingly on end times and doom paintings. Doom paintings are paint, painted all over the walls in parish churches with the mouth of hell depicted as a gaping mouth of a beast and in the corresponding corner, gates of heaven. The figure of death, as you can see in this whole Holbein engraving, is often personified as a skeleton, often dancing or inviting the Christian to a moderate life. So usually these depictions are a warning to the powerful, right? King death is coming for you. As a comfort to the poor, this is all gonna be over. And also as an invitation to piety. I should point out here that death is um, a little bit different than our depictions of the Grim Reaper, which is often sort of divorced from a Christian context. 
um, here death is still defeated by Christ and in a way sometimes acting as Christ's emissary. One of the ways in which we see this most clearly in church artwork is in what's known as the dance of death or the dance macabre. This is an amazing church in Slovenia, but you can find these uncovered in churches all across um, Europe. The bottom left-hand corner is, is the beginning of a dance of death, and that would show um, the figure of death interspersed with various members of medieval society. Um, so you, um, and it moves from the low end of society up through the high end of society with emperors and kings being in the center, and in the center of the image is usually Christ on a cross. This is one panel that's a little blurry, but you can see the longer procession there on the bottom. Various medieval social and economic roles depicted in individuals with death in between each one holding their hands. There's writing underneath and underneath each individual holding a particular social role. There would be a verse uh, from that person. So if he's a baker, he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm not done um, baking bread. I have so much more to live for. And then the next stanza underneath is death responding and saying, come with me. It is now your time. You, you have done well, or you have done ill, or whatever the case may be. And then in the images above, again, I'm showing this because this shows that this dance macabre is set within a Western medieval Catholic um, Christian context. So I think it's meant to be actually read um, right to left. So you can just see the base of the cross, presumably Mary there, Christ um, taken off the cross, being mourned by the women. The next appears to be the harrowing of hell. At least Christ is spearing some kind of weird devil-like figure. And then the last on the far, far left is, of course, the resurrection. And so this dance of death, right, is all um, covered underneath this image of Christ rising out of the tomb. All of this is very hard. It all feels darker than our current experience, but it's also reflective of our current experience. And so in closing, I want to turn to the history of one more saint of the church for our edification and encouragement. This saint's life is very foreign to us, despite the fact that she's English. The extremity of her personal devotion to Christ is both admired and distrusted by my students when I first introduced them to her. The glory of this saint is that for her, in the end, it is God's love that binds and draws all Christians together, despite the harshest of circumstances. And of course, I'm speaking of the great Julian of Norwich. Much of what we know about Julian is from her own writings called Showings of Divine Love. This is the first book written in English by a woman. She's born in 1342, five years before the first outbreak. She lived through three outbreaks of the plague in her area. She may have been married at one point, but no one knows for certain. If she was, it's possible that her husband fought in the Hundred Years' War, which was always go also going on in France at the same time. She dies around 1416. Julian lived most of her life as an anchoress in a cell built for her attached to the parish church of St. Julian in Norwich. And so Julian is not actually her given name. Julian is her, the name she takes um, when she becomes an anchoress. Women like her chose a life of solitude. Uh, and so she was brought books um, she's extremely well read. She would be br brought books by other monks and clergymen. Her cell, um, her cell, which I'll show you here in a minute, would have two or three windows. One was for her maid to, to help her take care of her daily needs. Um, the other would be a small window to the outside where she could advise and counsel local people in the community. Um, because much like Ephraim and the Cappadocians, uh, Julian and other anchoresses in medieval England and Northern Europe served as spiritual mentors. 
And then there would be another window that would allow her um, basically to see the uh, Eucharist being performed and the host being raised. So it would be like a small uh, sliver of a window pointed directly at the east end of the parish church. When she took her vows, she was sealed into that cell. So she literally lived in that room without leaving for most of her adult life. And she commits herself to a life of service to the church and a life of prayer. On the 8th of June, 1373, Julian has a series of 16 visions during a prolonged illness from which she expected to die. Even at points, she seems to want to die, but she doesn't. Today, I think we would call this a near-death experience. She was probably around 30 when she had these visions. Since childhood, so she's like Macrina and like some of these other women of the church who from very early ages have these really strong spiritual convictions. From, from childhood, she had wanted to know or to be physically present at the cross as Christ was dying, to observe and to know fully what his suffering for her was. And she does talk about her faith in very individual ways that sound more reminiscent of the Reformation. She's also given um, visions of Mary, but most of these visions in the 16 uh, revelations are of Christ in various stages of his uh, suffering and death, several of them of his um, bleeding face. Julian's revelations or spiritual insights given to her range in topic from the nature of sin to the assurance of salvation to visions of heaven to the joy Christ experienced in his suffering because of his great love for us and the mystery of God's final reconciling work, reconciling work over creation. Her overall convictions from her vision is that God is love and to forget that, to forget that God is love is to miss the full Christian experience. She urges her fellow Christians on numerous occasions not to live in guilt, but to move forward in life with Christ. She gives us very powerful image some of you are probably familiar with. In fact, I would imagine that a number of you have actually read her showings or portions of it. But one of the images that she gives us is she's at the bottom of the sea. And even at the bottom of the sea, she cannot be separated from the love of God. God showed me two kinds of sickness that we have of which he wants us to be cured. One is impatience because we bear our labor and our pain heavily. The other is despair coming from doubtful fear as I shall say afterwards. And it is these two which most belabor and assail us by which our Lord showed me. And it is most pleasing to him that they should be amended. I'm speaking of such men and women as for the love of God, hate sin and dispose themselves to do God's will. So these are two secret sins, especially busy in tempting us. That struck me um, and was especially challenging and convicting to me um, in the current circumstances. Here's an image of her cell with a later window that's been put up with one of her most famous quotes, all shall be well. This image shows us that the vision that in the end all things will be well, she hears this from the bleeding face of Christ. So her texts are a really powerful example of how a fellow Christian responded to cataclysmic circumstances, both socially, societally, and personally. Future and unseen peace is assured to her through visions of suffering in her own tribulation, in her own times. Like so many we have considered together over the last seven weeks, she shows us a life lived in submission to God in service to the church. She is unflinching in her descriptions of Christ's physical sufferings, which I think actually tells us as much about the reality of her own surroundings and the presence of human suffering that was around her consistently and how Christ's suffering for those communities was often seen as a parallel comfort. She discusses her own bodily torment and her desire for death. She's a very, very human saint. However, unlike the flagellants whose theologies seem to fixate on God's vengeance and punishment of humanity, Julian's work presents us with a vision of God's all-consuming love. And so here's the final passage I want to share together 
with you for the series. I saw that he is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. He is our clothing that for love wrappeth us, claspeth us, and all encloseth us for tender love. And he may never leave us, being to us all thing that is good as to mine understanding. Also in this, he showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand, and it was as round as a ball. I looked thereupon with eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it might last, for me thought it might suddenly have fallen to naught for littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasteth and ever shall last, for that God loved it. And so all thing hath the being by the love of God. Thank you so much for joining me over the last few weeks. Be safe and take care.